Hey, welcome to Lead Full. My name is Chesley Lunday. I am your host today. Here's the deal. We know that life, no matter how successful you are, can sometimes be an exercise in futility. And we want to help you defeat futility in your lives. We want to help you develop fulfillment and we want to help you change the world because we know this, when leaders are fulfilled, they fill the world with hope. Now, let's get ready to lead full. Would you like to be a blue collar millionaire? I think all of us would. I don't know. My hands, you know, don't have the calluses they used to, but uh, I like white collar. But my next guest, Jeremy Candelaria, wrote the book Blue Collar Millionaire, and he is a pastor and runs a million dollar concrete business on the side, right? And so uh, Jeremy is actually my best friend. We've known each other for years and we get to talk about what it looks like to, to grow a business, to follow Jesus and make disciples in a business. And then also what the church might look like with a co-vocational, meaning being a pastor and owning a business side by side and what that looks like for the future. All right, here we start with our conversation with Jeremy Candelaria. Hey, I am here with Jam Jeremy. Blah, 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 I can't. Blah, 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 that's all, folks. <laughs> no, not really. I'm here with Jeremy Jeez, Candelaria. Jeremy. He's like, we're done. This is great because Jeremy's actually my best friend, so I could say anything and get away with it. If this was anyone else, we <laughs> we would have a problem. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, it, I'm not editing this out at all. It's hey, what's what it <laughs> <laughs> like you just flubbed on your your friend's name. It just yeah, wow. yeah your best friend's <laughs> name. Yeah, <laughs> which is Hi, so everybody. funny. I'm Jeremy Candelaria. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's good to be with you, Chesley. So everybody right. on my podcast, well, almost everybody, talks about my DC characters, and um, let's be honest, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> You're DC like... is like the ugly stepbrother to Marvel. Oh man, that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Although I do like Batman and Superman, like those two. Wonder Woman's all right. I don't even know who the person over there, the other side is, but that is Aquaman. Yeah. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. That's the new Aquaman. I mean, it's the anti-lame Aquaman. Yeah, he's a good he's Aquaman. A good Aquaman. Man. Yeah. I got to give it to him. I mean, growing up DC, those those characters were my favorite. favorite. Batman, Batman, Michael Keaton, my favorite. favorite. Superman, Superman, obviously, I thought I looked looked like like him him when I had hair. Um, Just a foot shorter and a little bit wider. (laughs) When you're nine, you don't realize you're short. You know what I mean? Oh, that's fair. That's fair. Everybody's kind of the same height back then. I didn't realize I was short until I was about 36. Uh, (laughs) Then it hit me like a ton of bricks. But... It yeah, took no, you I that like long? The DC characters. Yeah, it really did. I promise you it did. Because I, I, I think I actually shrank, shrunk uh, to an inch and a half from my peak from all the heavy lifting, for real. Yeah. Um, and then I was like, oh, well, five, five eight's not bad, but five, six and a half is pretty bad. So, hey, you can't have everything, man. That's all right. My younger brother, Christian, is still shorter than you. Good. Eat that, Christian. Just know, okay? You'll grow up one day, son. You better walk. You, You're going to get a text pretty soon. It's going to be great. So, actually, it'll be a month from now when this actually airs. I'm going to text him. I'm an obscure text, uh, Eastern or Western, you know, Pacific time uh, from your brother. Right, right. So uh, obviously I brought you on here, not just to hang out, but uh, you've written two books, Life 45 and Blue Collar Millionaire, which uh, you're welcome on the title. Um, <laughs> no, Thank you. Yeah, just publicly stating that yeah. it should be co-written. Yeah. Jeremy Candelaria <laughs> and just oh, you know what I should I definitely should have put you in the acknowledgments oh, oh yeah yeah back that'll in the like the, that'll be the next one that's the, coming out the next one yes <laughs> oh well sorry it's okay it's all right I get it I feel it I, I'll if you do that I'll buy 10 books the next time but uh, done, uh, done 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 what do you want you, you want, want a chapter, chapter? Uh, wow a chapter I was just gonna say dedicate the whole thing to me 
Okay. It's blue collar sales is the name of it. So, oh, I, mean, it, you know, I don't yeah. know. You probably shouldn't do that other than I have a big mouth and that will work. So blue collar sales. Have as but, big yeah. of a mouth as Chesley and you can get just about anything done. No, I'm just playing. Hey, you and me both. <laughs> right. It's okay. okay. So yeah. you wrote Blue Collar Millionaire. So that's where I'd like to start. Just tell us your story because your backstory is uh, really fascinating um, into uh, the, the, the journey into the business that you have now. And then mm -hmm. go in from there to why you decided to write Blue Collar Millionaire. All right. So um, there's a lot of different angles I can come in to this. But basically, I've been pastoring for 20 years. And... Uh, we planted a church that was fairly successful and I was pretty comfortable and I felt God calling me out of the boat. And I mean, really just, let's just capsize this boat. And so what we did was we put together a plan to leave the church we planted in Akron, which is still there, still going, still loving Jesus and uh, pack up our, our four kids, my wife and I, our two dogs, three of their friends drive all the way across the United States to a place called Palm Springs, where we virtually knew zero people, and uh, and plant Movement West. So Movement East is here in Ohio, Movement West out there. And we did that. It took two years because there was one stipulation. The stipulation was, Lord, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I'll walk away from the salary. And if you've ever planted a church before, it's not, it's not easy. But when you actually get to a place where you're comfortable and, you, you know, you, you've got the things you need you got your office you got your this you got your that and you walk away from it and you walk away from the relationships you've built i mean there's something to that so i was totally willing to do that totally on board but my one request was that you would make god you would make all four of my kids want to go reason is is because i know so many horror stories about pastors who have basically put their family on the bag burner for the name of the church. And I just never wanted to be one of those people. And so we prayed for two years for all four of our kids from the time he told us to go to the time we left. It was two years. Finally, my oldest daughter, the only one we were waiting for decided that she was ready to go. And we put a succession place and uh, plan in place. And we left. And right before we left, she told us, um, I don't want to go. That was six months from the time she said yes to the time we actually left. So even before we started, she was in a funk about it. And so I said, at this point, now we have us staying here. We have we will be a liability and not an asset. God wants us to go. We made the decision to go. We cannot stay. So we left and uh, it was a hard, bittersweet, exciting, amazing, incredible journey. Problem is from jump, my daughter could not disconnect from her friends here uh, long enough to connect there. And the reason is, is because these wonderful, beautiful things, the technology behind it, um, house party and, you know, FaceTime and, you know, whatever other things that they were doing at the time, this has been a couple years ago. But so she started to fall into a depression. I'm planting a church. I'm gone 12 hours a day. I know no one. Again, zero traction. Yes, I do have money. I do have a little bit of help from the SBC, the Summit Baptist, uh, Southern Baptist Convention, because they saw what we did over in Ohio. Um, but I'm coming home to kids crying themselves to sleep. My two youngest kids loved it. My two older kids would cry themselves to sleep for two different reasons. And it only you could only take that so much and you don't realize how much your family, your family around your family helps to carry the load of your kids when you don't realize that until you don't have it. So like cousins going over to a cousin's house, going to grandma's house when you don't have any of that, it's just you. So I'm exhausted. I'm coming home and I'm and and I'm I'm trying to encourage them to make friends and i'm praying and my wife and i are begging god and and i just began to get bitter because i said god i left everything for you and i had one request and my request was that they would want to go because i don't want them to grow up bitter toward you or the church i'm trying to protect their relationship with you why can't you do it so are we obviously we had some we had some success there pretty rapid zero to 60 in literally three weeks um 20 something six or seven salvations two baptisms the the greater the church did the, the more terrible my family did 
until the day that we went to church and then my cat uh, got outside and in the desert, cats don't survive real well. Um, so we think that, sh that the cat was eaten by a coyote. Yeah. And we don't know, but we like walked the desert arm in arm. Like we were looking for a dead body, put pictures up. The reason why we did that is because it was Emily's cat, my oldest daughter who was struggling so much. She ended up saying, why does everything good have to leave my life? And so I made a decision at that point, and I didn't tell the kids yet, but I told my wife, um, if I have the power to stop these my kids from hurting and I don't do it, what kind of father am I? So I said, tomorrow we're going to have a family meeting, and I am going to, we're moving back. That meant that I'd have to throw 20 years of ministry away. That meant that I did not have any form of income. I had literally laid it all on the table. People had donated thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. I had to go to my boss and say, I'm choosing my family over ministry. I'm sorry. And they were very encouraging, very uplifting, saying that I did the right thing. And I told my family and then we moved back here. And I wrote on my journal before I left because I was bitter. I was angry at God. And I wrote, I said, you know, I, I'm going to go back, create a business. I already knew what I was going to do. I'm going to make a lot of money. And then I'm just going to travel with my family. Family. Yeah, and you told so, me that a couple yeah, times, too. Yep, yep. So, so we moved all, we moved back, and we moved back intentionally. I had 20 grand saved. It wasn't a lot, but I had some money. But we moved back and intentionally moved into my in-law's house. Upstairs, it's a small house, and the kids literally rotated on who had to sleep on the floor, who got the futon, and who got the blow-up mattress, because I have four kids. One room, look, I was kind of bitter. I was like, look... You guys wanted to be here? All right, you're here. We went from that plush house to this room. We're going to rotate. And uh, and I don't know if that was wrong or right, but I was like, you know what? We're roughing it. That's what we're going to do. And 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 it, eventually we ended up buying the house that we live in. And But I did just that. I created um, a business. I was the only employee. I did it in February. And if you know anything about the Midwest in February, it's bitter cold. It's terrible. It's a bad idea. And so Snow on the Ground created the LLC, and that summer was our first year. Hired a couple of employees, fell by the wayside, some stayed. One was a true gem that is still with me today. And that year we did five or 400000 in revenue, um, which at the time was way more money than I had ever made in the church. I mean, <laughs> church, you're planting, church planting. I know what it's like to be broke. You know, we used to spend a hundred dollars a week on groceries and goods for our house with six of us, four kids, my wife and I. So we, we knew how to make pennies pinch, but yet now we're, we're making a little bit more money and, um, business has always been something that's just been inherently natural. It comes natural to me. I wish, I wish riding a bike would come as natural. I wish dunking a basketball would come as natural, but it just doesn't. I haven't found really anything that comes more naturally to me than business other than maybe speaking. And so the second year I made a, a hire, I bought some equipment, invested into the company and it did uh, 700,000. Third year we, uh, we did an on average over a hundred thousand dollars a month. So we broke the million dollar mark. This is our fourth year. And so Obviously, with business, as with life, it's never straight up to the right. There's always ebb and flow. And so if you can't handle that as an entrepreneur, if you can't handle that as a Christian or a believer or a man or a woman, you're not going to do well uh, because there are always going to be bumps and scrapes and bruises along the way. But I actually, you know, I, I don't welcome that stuff, but I don't I don't hate it when it comes. I learn to appreciate it. And that's and I've learned that. Money changes hands when problems are solved and problems have to come up in order for you to see an, an opportunity to make money. And so there, there are problems that have happened and issues with my company and it's good stuff, all good stuff. Like, for example, last year, my project manager, literally the Lord told me mid season, this was going to be our breakout year. This was going to be amazing. Of course, COVID threw us for a wrench for a second. We recovered. He said, your project manager is not going to be with you next year. 
And so I just asked my project manager out of the blue, as soon as I heard the Holy Spirit say that, I said, you're not, you're not going to be here with me next year, are you? And he said, who told you that? I said, Jesus. And uh, he's a believer, so he could see it. Um, and, and he's not. The, the, the problem with that was that he's the best concrete guy I, I have. He's 44 years old, always shows up, always consistent, and literally is a monster when it comes to concrete, like amazing. So now next year, I'm not going to have a project manager. And that means that I will either have to collapse back down into that role, which I've, you know, there's a difference between working in the business and on it. Talk about it in my book. Uh, but I also, at this point, am now pastoring in church. So how did that happen? We could talk about that. Uh, but nonetheless, I had to find someone. And um, man, I, I did. The, the, it is an incredible strategy. Basically, I went to my supply house where I get all my concrete stuff. Like it's a supply house. We get rebar, color, we get, you know, tools. All the concrete guys go to this place. And I went there and I said, uh, Braden, one of the, uh, probably should not have mentioned his name, but I'm sure they probably won't watch it. But, um, I said probably one of the guys not. there who, I said, listen, if you find me a guy, I need five names, top five names of guys that come in here that maybe are underemployed or looking for something give them to me. He pulled out his book and he was kind of, you know, he did it. He, I said, look, I'm gonna give you 500 bucks if I find a guy and I hire him. Ended up finding a guy and he's 33 years old. He's a stud. He has the business sense that my previous guy didn't. Maybe doesn't have the um, skill set that he did, but that can be developed because he's 33. The other guy was 44. Um, so he's more spry. He's ready to go. He's hungry. He's business minded. Um, and, and so here we are this fourth year now, and we're still holding strong. I mean, you know, we're my goal is to get us to the point where we're doing 40 grand a week in revenue. So that's kind of a, an update on that side. Do um, you want me to tell them how I became the pastor? I'm interrupting this amazing interview because I want to tell you about something really quickly. I want to tell you about Followers Made. A lot of us have been in church for a very long time, and yet we are, you know, we have problems because we don't exactly know what it means to follow Jesus. And it's not actually sitting in a pew or sitting in a seat listening to a preacher. It's actually developing the gifts and call that God has on our lives and also developing intimacy with Jesus. Now, dudes, I know that word intimacy seems a little weird, but give it a chance. We want to help you develop your relationship with Jesus and develop the call of God that is on your life. And so we would love for you to text 480-531-9015 and do this for me. Text hello to 480-531-9015. I'm going to get back to you and we would love to set up a time to show you what that system followers made looks like and how we might help you uh, follow Jesus better in your context. Now back to the interview. Actually, before <laughs> you do that, let's go ahead and talk about, so you, 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 you have all that background experience. You're doing very, you're doing a great job. And then now you have this ability to write and start speaking. And you wrote this book, blue collar millionaire. So mm -hmm. where I would like to head is um, let's talk about the book first. And then um, you said some things that I would really like to press into about you started. Jesus was talking to you about your business. <laughs> and so I want to get into that a little bit later. But first, like, let's talk about your book. Yeah. So Blue Collar Millionaire is essentially six simple steps to take your mom and pop or small blue collar business and build it to uh, a yeah, seven figure business. And the reason why I wrote the book is because I am surrounded and have been surrounded by blue collar workers my whole growing up life. And reason is, is I didn't have a dad that like swung a hammer or anything, but I've been married 20 years. And the very first time I ever met my wife's dad, I was 15. We were dating, we're high school sweethearts. And he came home barreling up the driveway like 100 miles an hour in his gravel driveway, big, huge box truck, leaving dust behind him in his wake. And she jumps up and says, my daddy's home. Do you want to meet my daddy? And I'm like, 
okay, you're hot. Whatever you tell me to do, we'll go do it right now. And I go out there and I and I shake this guy's hand. And if you ever remember Shrek, those big, huge sausage fingers like just surrounded and engulfed my hand because at the time I'm 100 pounds, 15 years old. I wrestled. I'm 100 pounds. And the very first thing he said to me was, can you work, boy? And I was like, oh, like, I, I've never had a job. So I said, yes, sir, I, I can work. Well, that Saturday we went out and he yelled and screamed, man of God, didn't cuss, but didn't have to. Just freaked me out. I, I like, but I loved it. I had none to compare it to. I, I, you know, any other job, if I would have had a job, I'd have had sense to say, sorry, buddy, I can't, I'm busy, but I really liked her. And so long story, really short, essentially over time, we became partners. And this is while I was planting churches. I've always kind of done this in the beginning. It was because I had to, it came to a point where it's because I wanted to, but then he had, this is before I left for California, he had triple bypass surgery. He couldn't really do it anymore. He knew I had business acumen. The reason why I wrote the book partially is because he was an incredible, in his heyday, an incredible con, like construction worker. We did all kinds of things, brick, block, stone, concrete. But he just did not have the business sense behind it. And I don't know why I knew that. I don't know how that happened. But I said to myself, well, you know what, if... If this is the way he's doing it, I'm sure there are others that are doing it this way too, which is just no good, no vision, no clear values, no clear direction. It's almost like getting in your car, right in the book. It's like getting your car, your work truck on a Monday and just driving aimlessly. And that's what a, a lot of businesses and companies are doing because they don't have a clear end in mind. They don't have a clear vision of what they're trying to do. They don't have what I call a clear market identity. You can never know your market value if you don't know your market identity and you you can't understand your market identity unless you know who you are, what your end game is, what separates you from everyone else that's doing what you're trying to do. And it just that that's such a foreign concept to a, most blue collar guys. They're like, what are you talking about? Just give me a hammer. Right. And a beer and I'll be good to go. That, but that's not how you build a million dollar business in three years. It's not how you do it. So that's how that's how I wrote the book for people like that. And I lay it out. No fluff. It's like literally like Cliff, Cliff's notes to my own book because I want those guys to read it and I want it to be lightning punch, punch, punch. Here's what you need to do. Here it is. Step by step. Here's how you attract customers. Here's how you track the right employees. Here's how you create a culture. Here's your one page attack and conquer plan. Here's how you set your company up to where it will serve you. You don't have to serve it. You can step away and take your family to Florida while your company's still making money. Like those are the kind of things that I write in that book and I want people to read it. Just dropped. It's it's already a bestseller. Two bestsellers now. Very thankful for that um, on Amazon. You can pick it up on Amazon. Amazon. So, so put that in the show notes, Chess. Put that in the show notes. Yes. So, um, yeah. So you, um, at this entire time, you were planting churches. You learned how to do concrete from your father-in-law, um, mm -hmm. which is, mm -hmm. I believe, is a fascinating story in and of itself. You're married to your high school sweetheart. Um how did you learn that God had a plan in business and he was, he was concerned about your success in business, not just, uh, your spiritual walk in your, and in, in church world. Yeah, that's yeah, a great that's question. Good. And for many years, planting movement, the first one, I wrestled with that. I wrestled with that and still to this day somewhat wrestle with it nowhere near like I did. And there was an older gentleman in our church who knew he knew that I had business sense because he was a businessman. He had invested a lot in our plant. He had become a good confidant of mine. And I would have I would have these conversations with him. This is when I was 26, 27, 28 years old. And I would say, you know, I really, really love pastoring but I really love business too. And one day he said to me, he said, Jeremy, those two things are not enemies. They're friends. And essentially he was the guy that gave me permission to go, okay, it's okay for me 
to not be linear in just one thing because you know 20 30 40 50 years ago if you're called to pastor the pastorate that's what you do and you forsake everything for that and you basically take an oath of poverty or whatever they want to pay you uh and and you put all your eggs in that basket look i came to the conclusion that i'm not wired that way i am not wired to just do pastoral ministry and i think that i know that that is okay god has not i'm not a one-trick pony and for those people out there that do that hey no harm no foul you do you boo boo that's just not me all right i know that i have to be doing multiple things not only am i not only am i you know pastoring this church full time but i also you know run a concrete company full time i also write books i also speak i also travel there's more that i want to do i want to get into real estate i don't i don't want to pare it down i want to open it up and it all started with the conversation somebody in my church that had business acumen uh, said to me you having a desire for business and also a desire for the church it's not enemies stop thinking it like that they're friends because one can serve the other and that's what's happened yeah, that's great. So I met you in the middle of that journey, right? You became my church plant coach, actually, when I was yep. in Omaha, Nebraska. And you really laid the groundwork for me and where I'm headed right now with King City and the digital church. Um, but you have shown kind of the pathway uh, that I think a lot of other pastors are going to be going down within the next uh, five to 10 years. So um i want to paint a picture of what it looks like to grow a business that is uh, uh that is kingdom minded not just not just self um self aggrandizing self uh self-centered mm -hmm. and you, mm -hmm. you you've done that right so you yep. you're yep. learning I mean, you build and develop disciples out of your business and uh, i think there's a picture for that as uh young leaders you know, one of the things that we're told often is, um, at least this used to be the case. I don't know if it's going to be the case moving forward as much, but if you want to follow Jesus, you should become a pastor. Um, yeah, but yeah, you're yeah. showing that actually it's probably, if you want to follow Jesus, you should probably be in the marketplace. And so what does it look like to build a business uh, while you still have the mission of God in your heart? Yeah. Great question. And a couple things come to mind. The first is this, and I teach my kids this, money does not change you. Money reveals who you are and what you really believe. So if you are a stingy, self-aggrandizing, selfish, self-centered person without money, you will be the same way when you get money. And those are the type of people that people don't wanna be around. If you are a generous person, who will do anything for anyone without money, when you get money, it's that, but multiplied. And that's where the real fun is. I mean, Fran and I give away an insane amount of money. I mean, look, this is probably gonna be just a little bit of a, of a what do you call that, a humble brag, but I'm gonna do it anyway, all right? Let me give you an example, okay? So last night, uh, obviously I paid my son because he's a little punk, he needs to get, he needs to work to get paid. Now I got to teach him something, right? He's not really, he's, he's a great kid, but he, he mowed the grass 25 bucks. Right. Um, and then, but in addition to that, obviously I have four kids, two of their cousins was over and one of my daughters had her little friend over. So I just had in mind, you know what? I want to bless my kids. I want to bless my nieces. I want to bless my daughter's friends. So I, I went upstairs and I got a huge stack of money just because of the look of it. You know, it was, I mean, it was, it was like, it was like $3,500 in twenties. Right. So it looks really big. And so I went to each one of the rooms and I just was like, you know what? I'm really proud of you here. I'm really proud of you here. I'm really proud of you here. And you know, I don't even know how much that is. You can do the math. I think there was seven kids. All right. Plus the $25 that he was paid for mowing the grass, which he, you know, he earned. Um, 
small little things like that because I've intentionally made that switch because I don't want to bless everyone else's kids at the sake of my own, right? We'll go to a restaurant and do something crazy for somebody. I'm getting off topic, but what it, money is simply a revealer of who you are. And that really comes down to your value system and how you believe um, how you believe because how you believe affects what you think what you think affects what you what you do essentially and and so as how how that kind of ties into business is that i love rewarding my guys in that there are values that i hold true to and they know it so i always say there's two types of leaders there's hitler leaders and there's jesus like leaders hitler leaders and i'm talking my business hat now even when it comes to the church i don't i don't i you know i know you're supposed to kind of keep that sacred versus secular thing i think we are who we are right um i'll do this with my leaders as well but there's hitler here in the church there's hitler type leaders and jesus hitler type leader says if you don't do what i want you to do i'll shoot you jesus type leaders say you know what I'm going to show you. And for example, the other day I was out on the job checking on it because it was, you know, a job uh, that was actually my cousins and I wanted to oversee, just wanted to make sure it was right. I'll go check on them. And it was 82 degrees here and concrete 82 degrees in the direct sun. And it's a stamp job is difficult. So, you know, I'm checking on them and I say, listen, guys, I'm talking to my cousin. I'm like, you know, if you need me, I'm here. So one of them says, hey, can you run down the center of that pad, which means I'm on boards and, you know, I've literally have a blister from it from yesterday and I'm scrubbing it out with two other guys that are scrubbing out with me. They're dying. I'm loving it. And um, and and they're stamping behind us. I say that to say that that's I'm showing them I'm not shooting them. I'm showing them that I'm willing to do whatever it takes for my company. But it comes down to these values, which for me, it's excellence, honor, joy, flexibility and ownership. And everything gets filtered through my business by those five things. So if they're going to be rewarded and I want to reward them, it's because they did something excellent. It's because they're honoring each other, the customer and their bosses. It's because they have pivoted and they're flexible and they don't complain whenever there's something that, you know, that, that something happens. It's because they take ownership of not only their, their successes, but also their mistakes. Yeah, no, you know, that was, that was me. I'm sorry. And I want to get that right. You know, it's because they exude joy. Attitude is everything. We've all been a part of a company where we are someplace we worked. I don't care if it's Arby's where we didn't want to be there. It's not that the work was so bad, but it's the environment was so bad that it's like, man, I, I don't mind the job. But I can't stand the people. Well, the way I train my guys on a, every Monday, we pick a value, we talk about it. And, and uh, I say, look, joy is something that you choose to bring into this space. You choose. And then I'll hit them with, you know, this is the day the Lord has made let us rejoice. I don't hide my faith. I pray for them once a week uh, with them on Mondays for the week. I say, you know what? I'm about to bless you whether you want it or not. And I don't hide who I am. They know through and through this is who I am. I live these values. I'm living this. So joy. And the reason why that's important is because what it does is it creates a culture. All of these values create a culture, a culture where people actually want to be. The way I say it is this, listen, you spend more time awake with each other than you do with your own family. You might as well actually enjoy it, right? So enjoy it, bring joy into it. And uh, one of the ways that you do that is by honoring each other. If you've ever seen staunch construction workers, and I know Chess, you've had a history with, you know, with blue collar stuff too. So you, you know what I'm talking about? Like they're ruthless. You know, to have a boss pray for you is not something that happens. And not only that, but, yeah, and not only that, but honor, they're finding ways to dishonor. And the way I explain it to him is, look, if you, it's okay to joke with each other and make fun of each other because that's normal. Matter of fact, if I don't make fun of you, I don't like you. So it's okay. But what's not okay is to jab the soul. It's not okay to say the dig that you know you're going to say to get that person so fired up that they want to walk away. That's dishonoring. So I'll reward if they honor and I'll rebuke if they dishonor. I, you know, I don't play any games. There is a line and I will hold it. Right. And that's my job. I'm the keeper of the culture. 
So I don't know if that directly answers your question, but every single thing that I do, whether it's in the church or outside of the church, is infused with my faith, and they see it and they know it. Yeah. I, I think who I am. absolutely. I, I'm just thinking back as you're talking about, you got the Hitler style leaders and the Jesus style leaders and Jesus style leaders lead from value based and modeling. Um, I'm just going to tell on myself cause I think that's good. Uh, so remember when you came and hung out with me, uh, at my church in Omaha, we had just gotten yeah. done, um, doing a pretty good job on our launch. And I, we sat in a leadership meeting and um yeah i i think i think i basically led into him i was just like we did this wrong we were not doing this well we're just like oh, we just, and yeah. you just sat there and then took me out to coffee and you're like bro i would never work for you <laughs> no nope. uh, it was uh <laughs> To your credit, though, you have so – that was years ago. Yeah. And you have so created and even reminded me, uh, hey, let's focus on one thing we need to improve on. This is your deal. Y you taught me this. Let's focus on one thing we need to improve on, and let's celebrate all seven other things rather than, you know, what type A driven visionary type leaders, it's no, it's, you, know, it's, you know, no denigration to you, tend to do. Hey, that was awesome. All right. Now, what do we need to fix? Because oh, we man, messed up. We could do yes. better, right? Come on. Yeah. yeah. And that was the yeah, biggest so thing is like that need for celebration and sitting there and yeah. going, hey, let's talk about how we uh, embodied our values today rather than sitting here and being willing to sit and just go, we messed up on this and we messed up on this. And I was just like, I was wearing my team sure. out. And yeah. I, so I'm saying this from experience the stuff that you wrote in your book about this stuff. Like this is super important because what ended up happening is in that church, um, we didn't make it. Um, I learned a lot of great leadership lessons through failure. And I realized out of all this stuff that you had taught me, like I, I need, if I put those things into practice, we're not going to have the same problems that we had. And even if we fail, um, these people will know that they're loved and cared for. Um, but in my line of work, and this is probably a lot of our leaders that have been through church, they see the church abuse. It's usually these type A leaders that don't sit down and, and have the ability to say, you know what, let me be humble. Let me, let me show you what value-based leadership looks like. And let me, uh, let me celebrate where we did well. And you taught me that now you're getting to teach other people through the book. Um, but yeah, I, I know what it's like to be the other place. And so many other organizations are ran, um, through a Hitler style leadership. And I think God's calling us to move towards what, what Jesus, what Jesus style leadership would look like. Obviously, you know, Jesus being God, I think he was trying to show us the way anyways. Yeah. Uh, yeah so, um, co-vocational leadership. You're a pastor too, right? And so I, I don't like to hang out on the pastor side all that often. I've been talking about reimagining church with a lot of other people. And I know it's funny, you know, I'm a digital church player. You and I have this conversation all the time. <laughs> he, he doesn't, he doesn't get it guys. He doesn't get it. But, but one of the things I do really love, and I think that's going to be new, uh, it's not new, but it is, uh, making a big comeback is this co-vocational style leadership. Could you speak into what it looks like to be a church leader and a business leader at the same time? What do people need to understand about that? that, that is not very apparent from the outside. Uh, and what kind of encouragement could you give to leaders that are like that? Speak to the pastor when they, they interviewed over a hundred people around the country for this church. And it just so happens that this church is in my backyard. I drove past this church every day going to high school and uh, actually was married in this church 20 years ago, had no ties, no affiliation whatsoever. It's just a beautiful building with stained glass. And she wanted to get married here because it was pretty and everybody does want to get married here. And, uh, but nonetheless, we fast forward. Okay. So they interviewed a bunch of people interviewed me and, uh, I, I, I didn't want to do it. But that's a conversation for another day. And <clears throat> here's what I knew. 
when they actually narrowed it down and they settled on me, and I'm speaking to the pastor, I had already built a business that was making at the time, well, the, the annual revenue, which is not like a lot of money, right? It's not a lot of money, but it's a lot more money than most pastors would, would generate. Our company did 700 that year. So I told them going in, listen, this is a business. I have lives that I have to look after. These are my guys, right? By this time, we had built a solid crew of six people. Their families depend on this. This is a real actual, you get your direct deposit every you know Friday morning at 2 a.m. kind of business, right? Um, and I will not give that up. Here's what it did. It freed me up to do what God called me to do here. And let me explain this very, very quickly. Let's say that there's 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 a husband and wife with two kids, maybe maybe six years old, eight years old. They're in Nebraska. They're scouted by this church and this denomination, and they the, 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 this church loves them. They, they fit the family dynamic. Everything looks awesome. But the wife of that guy is hesitant because they had just moved two years before. She really wants security for her kids to be able to grow up in an environment where they can actually flourish and they can thrive. And he's promising her, babe, if we move to Akron, Ohio, and we are pastoring this church, look, we're going to stay in for the long haul. God has given me a vision for this place. I, it looks like, you know what, we could really turn it around. I'm telling you, we're going to be here. She says, okay, they pack up everything. They move here. He's all fired up. He's all excited. He's young. He doesn't even know what he's doing. He doesn't even know what he's in for. And all of a sudden, about, uh, I'd say about five, six, seven months in, he realizes that the people that are actually in charge have a whole nother idea of what his job description is. And so he starts to hear words like, We've never done it that way, which is the seven you know, fatal words of every dying church around. He has this vision. He's all excited. But all of a sudden, he hears the chirpers in the church, the, 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 the deacons, the watchdogs, these people that give a lot of money, that have a lot of influence, say, Pastor, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that here. But wait a minute. You called me here to change this thing, um, and now you're telling me I can't. So now he has a conundrum. The conundrum is this, Chesley, and this, I bet you this happens so many times across churches like mine in America, and that is this. Either I forsake the vision that I feel God has put on my heart at this place, and I go with what they want me to do, and I basically become their puppet rather than a leader, or I will do what God is wanting me to do. They'll fire me. Now I got to answer to my wife. So do I answer to the deacons or do I answer to my wife whom I promised we would be here for 20 years? The kids would grow up. We just got them plugged into school. They're just getting their bearings about them. And, and now this is a wrestle, right? Here's what I did not have to deal with. I don't care if you fire me or not. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm telling you, I'm coming here to do what God wants me to do. You can keep your money. I will not be bid by the highest guy. I will not answer to the squeakiest wheel. I will answer to Jesus. And if it comes down to offending you or Jesus, I promise you, I will offend you. I am not being mean. I'm going to set this up in advance to let you know that you do not control me. Now, here's why that couldn't happen for the, uh, the guy from Omaha because where else would he go? They just spent a year and a half vetting him, a year and a half interviewing him. He had three different meetings where they flew him in here and they talked to him and made sure he was the right guy. A year and a half, he takes this job and then a year from now, if he quits or they fire him, where does he go? How does he take care of his family? Where does his money come from? And that is a problem in the church. And that is one of the reasons why I, I'm doing what you, you what you call co 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 uh, what is that co vocation because I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket. I just won't do it, and that frees me up to do what I feel well, God I wants, feel me, God to do wants this place. me to do in this place. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. I see it's going to yeah, be the crazy. new norm moving forward. Um, there's there's a 
there are multiple expressions of what church is going to be in the in, in the future that doesn't um, that doesn't bode well for the institutional ch- piece of the church. And so one of the uh, ways that pastors are going to make a living, and one of the ways they're going to serve their people better is if they uh, understand what a real job looks like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yet God can provide uh provide for those families in ways like I, my lowest paying jobs have always been the church. You know, I you yeah. talked about me having experience as a blue collar boss, you know. Um I I owned my own uh painting company for 6 years and I ran a crew of eight and I was doing, uh, over 150 some odd houses and businesses and stuff per year. Um, I know what it's like to run that. I also know that you get paid a little bit more money when you're doing more business and you're providing more value to the community. The other piece is, um, and I wish I could have seen this as a younger, uh, as a younger guy, because I was so like, I felt like the only way that I could serve the church was be a, be a pastor and ministry because that's what I was taught my entire life. But I was meeting so many people in the community. I was that's right. I could have I could have prayed with them. I could have learned about them. I could have been a real staple in the city that I was a part of in Missouri when I ran my construction company. Had I known that this is just as legit of a roadmap as and and maybe in some cases even more because it opens more doors. Then if you're sitting in a desk yeah. in a church office, not do not meeting the community's needs. Yeah, let me speak to that. Let me give you a real life example. We just uh, we just did my cousin's patio. And uh, and so I obviously got them started on the job that day, went in to uh, the house to um, to collect half payment, but also just to kind of catch up with them. And it ended up me praying for them praying for them, husband and wife, praying for their family. And these are not people who go to church. The church came to them. Uh, We all said, amen. My cousin, who's a big, tough dude, his wife, they were both just bawling. This has just happened two days ago. Literally, you're right. You, You don't have to have a suit and tie on to, to be a minister of the gospel. You don't have to do that. Not to mention, to, to your point, these these men that work for me, I always tell them, look, we're building men. If we build good men, the concrete company is going to do well itself. I care more about building you than I do building a business because if I build you right, you can't just hire a hand. You have to hire the man. And when you start to work on building that person and being a good example, Dude, that's church, man. You know, I'm praying for them. I'm encouraging them. I'm rebuking them. Like literally, it's my little gang of disciples, right? That that I get to encourage. And and my my one is like my, you know, my top circle. You know, my project manager is going to get more of my time than than the rest of them. And then there's somebody else that gets a little bit more time than the rest of them. Like literally, it kind of goes down that way, just as Jesus did it. So absolutely, the influence. And then not only that, like you were touching on the things that you can do with with dollars to be a blessing back to the church or back to a group of people or individuals is incredible that you couldn't do because you're right. The lowest paying job tends to be the church. Yeah. Outside of working for free, when I first got my first paid position with the church, I was making sixteen hundred dollars a month for about fifty five hours a week. And my my wife was at home we were on food stamps and uh she had just had two babies to take care of like it was just man it was difficult yeah me too it was a thousand a month and by the way i I was so thankful for that yeah definitely and yet (laughs) but we were starving yes i know when we first planted this church literally the electric got cut off and uh, not this church, but movement. Yeah, movement. And and uh, it, it was um, no, it wasn't electric. It was gas because I had I let it lapse because it was summertime now, so you don't need heat. But so literally, my four kids, what we would do is my wife would have four pots of water on the on the stove, boil them all, fill the tub up with cold water because we didn't have a hot water tank because it's gas, and then go and dump those in there. And then all of my kids would take a bath, and then I would be the last one to take a bath. Yeah. I was yeah. planting a church. Yeah. I was planting a church. 
Don't miss those that days, bro. No more, dog. <laughs> no, that ain't happening no more, dog. No, don't miss those days. Uh, okay, so going back. we're running out of time, but you said something I really want to hit on. You said that you hire the man, not just the hands. And then you talked about the end goal is to develop men, build men, and then the concrete will take care of itself. You're doing that in business. You know how many churches don't don't understand that? Like they're building the organization, but they're not building the people, even in church. Like speak yeah. to that for a minute as we close. Like what would you say to churches that are building the organization rather than building the people that they're called to serve? I have to say is one of the things that you're so good at, Chesley, is to see what's coming. You are an innovator of innovators. You see things down the corridor of time that other people don't see, and you're right. And, and I, I am not like that. I'm not like that like you are. And even that correlation, that correlation is something that could be lost on most people, but it's not lost on you in that, hey, we're literally discipling men. Why would we not do the same thing in the church? And, and I think the reason is, is because we are enamored with the institution. We're enamored with the organization, with, with the church on Sunday kind of mentality rather than the people that make up the church on Sunday. And that's where Jesus really focused on, like, we just need to get back to doing business and church the way Jesus did it. Jesus really focused on a few people. And those few people focused on a few more people. And those few people focused on a few more people. But we, and so it's not, it's not this just institutional thought of the church is this big, arduous, titanic of a thing. And whoever has the biggest boat in the sea wins. It's a few people who we're really investing in. And if we care about them, then the things that we deal with on a church, the everyday church you know, basis are going to get taken care of. And people are going to be loved and people are going to be served and people are going to be helped. I mean, you're never going to run out of people that need stuff. Right. But really, as leaders, as the leaders, who are we intentionally breathing life into? Who are we, who do we have such a close relationship to that we could go, that is ridiculous. You, you are not holding to the standard here in this church of what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. I mean, because you've built the relational equity to have that conversation, right? I'm not just talking about getting up there and yelling at the congregation. I'm talking about people you walk with. Don't you think, I mean, think about Jesus and Peter. He looked straight at Peter and he said, get behind me, Satan. And Peter was probably like, what? Like, did he just call me the devil? Like, did he just do that? I mean, we've read it so much. It's become plain vanilla to us. But can you imagine Jesus looking at you in the eyeballs and saying, hey, Satan, get behind me. I mean, he had such a relationship with Peter that he could say hard things to Peter. And you know, as well as I do, when you're able to say hard things because people know that they love you, it produces a softness in their heart. And Peter ended up you know, given his everything for Jesus. And, and that's the point at the end of the day. And at the same time, also being able to reward people in the church that adhere to your values, like truly do. Hey, I don't want to catch you gossiping, bro. I want to catch you honoring. How about we try to honor, outdo each other in honor this week as a staff? What would that look like? How about you find a couple, a couple of people and you run them through that, that are on your team and you run them through our value system and you do the same exact thing. Don't Hitler them, Jesus them. Don't shoot them, show them this week. And you're going to micro, you know, like a, a microcosm of just a, like, a, a, you know, an incremental building of a culture is what you're really doing at the end of the day. Um that's going to actually, I think, in the long run, hopefully be effective, more effective than if you just think about the, the ship in the sea. Well, my ship's this size. Well, yours is only that size. Well, theirs is that big. Like, man, forget about all that. Who cares? At the end of the day, who Jesus is not going to say, you know what? Your church, your church was X amount of people. No, he's going to say, how many people did you lead and disciple and love? How many people did you serve? Like, who, what did you do really? Did the inside match the outside? Because what did he tell the Pharisees, right? I mean, don't get me started, Chess. I'm going to start preaching here. I mean, but literally, he's like, look, the outside of your bowl is clean, but the inside's full of dead man's bones. 
Like if you look like you're, you have the perfect church or the perfect family or the perfect business on the outside, but inside you're dying and inside your culture is toxic and inside, inside, if we were to peel it all back and we were to really see what's going on in your own heart, if you're jacked up, then, then that's the problem. You have to try with God's grace and his mercy and his forgiveness to try to make the inside of your organization, your church, your business, your heart match what you let everyone see on Instagram and what you let everyone see on Facebook and what you let everyone see on your stories, because that's all a show. But what really goes on is what's going to create something that I think Jesus is going to go, you know what? Well done. Well done. It only took 53 oh, minutes, but I got you to <laughs> preach. <laughs> oh, that's awesome, man. Hey, where can we find you on the internet? So, um, this is going to be a long one, but if you, if you want to shoot an email, you can connect at Jeremy Candelaria.com connect at Jeremy Candelaria.com. Uh, I'll get that. That's listed in the book about a million times. Um, you can find me there. You can also find me on Instagram, just Jeremy Candelaria. You know, I don't really use Instagram as much as, uh, you know, a millennial probably should. Um, also on Facebook, of course, but then Amazon, just go to Amazon and type in Jeremy Candelaria and then buy books. Awesome. Help, help, help me help you. All right. Yes. Jeremy yes, is a millennial in denial. He doesn't like to admit it, but yeah, I'm not taking that. I'm not taking that label. So good. I love you, man. Thanks. I love you too, Chesley. You're amazing. Thank you so much for even entertaining the idea of me being on your show. I'm grateful for what you're doing. Not a problem, bud. Write um, another only, book and we'll talk again. Not only for the church, dude, but, but for, for business in general. Like you're, you are trendsetting. Everybody needs to keep an eye on him because he's going places. I appreciate it. Hey, thank you for listening to our interview today. We're so excited to be able to bring these to you weekly. If you'd like to stay up to date on our blogs, on our podcasts, even some of our social media, or if you would like to say hi to me, you can reach out to us at 480-531-9015. Again, that's 480-531-9015. We know that when leaders develop fulfillment in their own lives, that they begin to develop fulfillment in others. And when fulfilled leaders lead, they lead and develop hope. And the world needs a lot more hope. So here's the deal. We would love to see you next week and let's lead full together.